On August 6, 1930, New York Supreme Court Judge Joseph Forrest Crater vanished in Manhattan somewhere near Times Square. He was last seen on West 45th Street at a restaurant called Billy Haas's Chop House. It was just after 9 p.m. He hailed a cab and disappeared into the night. Up until that August 6th night, 41-year-old Joseph seemed to be having a great year, and things only seemed to be getting better. He had recently been appointed as an interim justice for the state Supreme Court. How could such a rising star just vanish without a trace? Let's begin by examining Joseph's early days and his rise in his career up until his disappearance. Born on January 5th, 1889, Joseph was born in Easton, Pennsylvania. Named after his grandfather, Joseph seemed to be destined for greatness. Joseph attended Lafayette College and Columbia University. He worked smaller jobs as a law clerk as he worked his way through school. Eventually, Joseph was able to graduate and open his own law office. Joseph was known for making connections and networked with various bigwigs and politicians. He also joined the Tammany Hall, which was a New York City political organization of the Democratic Party. The Tammany Hall would be known for corruption and sleazy business practices that included favors and bribes, but we'll get into that a little later. In 1916, Joseph represented Stella Manns Wheeler in her divorce. Just seven days after the divorce was finalized, Joseph married Stella. Joseph was known by some to be a devoted and loving husband, yet others remembered Joseph for his many sleazy affairs with multiple showgirls. Whatever his personal life looked like, Joseph was a star in the legal field and he was also becoming well known in politics. On April 8, 1930, Governor Franklin D. Roosevelt appointed Joseph to the state bench Supreme Court. It seemed that Joseph achieved every goal he set out for himself. In July of 1930, Joseph was vacationing in Maine with Stella. He was not due back in New York until August 25th, when the courts were to resume. However, Joseph had told Stella that he needed to go back to the city to, quote, straighten those fellows out, but he did not provide her with any details. Joseph left and returned on August 1st, but his return was short as he departed again for New York on August 3rd. Stella would not hear from Joseph again. Joseph also failed to report to his new position in the state Supreme Court, which drew concerns from his fellow justices. By September 3rd, Joseph's disappearance was finally reported to the police who launched an investigation. Now let's go over a timeline of events. In April, Joseph withdrew $20,000 from his bank account around the same time he was appointed as a justice to the state Supreme Court. At the time, $20,000 would have been close to his yearly salary. This detail would add fuel to the rumors of Joseph's corruption later on in the investigation. In July, when Joseph and Stella were vacationing in Maine, he told Stella he needed to return to the city at the end of July. It is unknown if Joseph had returned to New York City, but he was spotted in Atlantic City with one of his showgirl mistresses named Sally Lou Ritzy. Joseph had returned to Stella in Maine on August 1st, but would leave again on August 3rd for New York. Before leaving, Joseph had promised Stella to be back by her birthday on August 9th. On August 6th, Joseph was in New York and had gone to his office. He spent a few hours going through his files. He had reportedly destroyed several documents and asked his law clerk to cash two checks that amounted to $5,150. Joseph and his law clerk then carted away two locked briefcases to his New York City apartment where the law clerk was told to take the rest of the day off. Joseph then booked a ticket to see the dancing partner at the Belasco Theater. Joseph also made dinner plans at the Billy Haas's Chop House, where he was seen with another attorney and friend named William Klein, as well as his mistress Sally Lou. 
William and Sally Lou initially claimed that Joseph was seen getting into a taxi cab a few minutes after 9 p.m. No taxi cabs reported ever picking Joseph up. Joseph was very well known and the increased publicity from the case made it very unlikely that a taxi driver would not have come forward had Joseph gotten into a cab. William and Sally Lou would then change their story that they had not seen Joseph getting into a cab, but that the two of them got into a cab and saw Joseph walking down the street. Stella would become concerned on August 16th, which was 10 days after Joseph was last seen. Stella had sent a driver to New York to look for him, but the driver came back empty-handed. Stella reported that she had went back to the city herself to search for Joseph. Inside the apartment Joseph shared with Stella, Stella found all of Joseph's clothes except for the clothing he was last seen wearing. All of the belongings that Joseph normally carried, including a watch, pen, and card case, were still on the dresser, as were his travel bags. When the courts resumed on August 25th, Joseph failed to appear. It was at this point that alarm bells began ringing. The other Supreme Court justices launched a discreet inquiry into Joseph, but there were still no signs of him. By September 3rd, the police were officially notified that Joseph was missing. The media got wind of the missing justice, and soon Joseph's photo was plastered all over the front pages of the media. Police investigated Joseph's disappearance. They had attempted to uncover what they could find, especially since Joseph was such a prominent figure in politics. Police discovered that Joseph's safety deposit boxes were emptied. The two briefcases that Joseph had taken from his office to his apartment with the law clerk's assistance were also missing. But there weren't many clues or witnesses to Joseph's disappearance. Adding to the mystery was the fact that Joseph's mistress, Sally Lou, was also missing in late September. She was later found in Youngston, Ohio, living with her parents, but her abrupt disappearance left questions as to why she would leave town so quickly after Joseph's disappearance. Police also looked into another mistress of Joseph's named June Bryce. Rumor was that June had attempted to blackmail Joseph so he withdrew a large amount of cash to pay her off. Stella had hired an attorney to help her in the legal matters after Joseph's disappearance. Stella's attorney focused in on June being responsible for Joseph's disappearance. Unsubstantiated rumors began that June had a gangster boyfriend of hers kill Joseph. June also had connections to Jack Legs Diamond, who was rumored to have killed anyone who crossed him. Then June also went missing, just one day before a grand jury for Joseph's case. 18 years later, she was discovered alive and had been committed to a mental hospital. As I had mentioned, a grand jury began to examine the case of Joseph to determine if Joseph was alive or dead. 95 witnesses and 975 pages of testimony were presented. Stella refused to appear before the grand jury. The grand jury was unable to determine if Joseph was alive or dead. Now the media was having a field day with Joseph's case. There were rumors of widespread corruption within the Tammany Hall. The rumors began that Joseph had purchased his justice seat, which only fueled the rumors that all justice seats were for purchase in New York. Scandals of high-ranking politicians accepting bribes were so widespread that the district attorney Thomas Crane was tasked at investigating and tracing payments from political bosses to members of Tammany Hall, of which Joseph was president at the time. Some speculated that Joseph had voluntarily disappeared as a way to escape the public corruption scandals he believed were coming. Ex-mistresses and showgirls came forward speaking of Joseph's shady activities and painting a portrait of illegal and shady activities. Around this time, Vivian Gordon was a high-end prostitute who came forward about her involvement with Joseph and other people of high influence. Vivian was associated with several well-known criminals at the time. 
Vivian had plans to meet with the city government corruption officials and was murdered five days later. This only continued to fuel rumors of Joseph's involvement with corruption and scandal. In January 1931, Stella moved back into the New York apartment she had shared with her husband. Police had previously searched the apartment when Joseph was reported missing. Police had also kept the apartment under 24-hour surveillance until January, which is when Stella made the decision to move back in. Stella had searched the apartment and found four envelopes. The envelopes contained $6,690 in cash, $2,600 in checks which Joseph had made out to himself, $521 of additional checks written by third parties, life insurance policies totaling $30,000 in which Stella was the beneficiary, and a will written in 1925 that left everything to Stella. There was also a three-page list of people and companies who owed money to Joseph. It had also been written in Joseph's handwriting. It was signed, Love Joe. This is all confidential. There was also a note that appeared to be written in haste that either read, I'm very weary, or I'm very sorry. It was believed that the list had been written before September 1st, 1930. The police stated that they had searched the apartment and if the envelopes were there, police would have found them. Had police missed these envelopes during their search of Joseph's apartment? Some speculated that Joseph had asked somebody to place the envelopes and note there after his death. Others speculate that Stella had actually located these envelopes much earlier than she had reported, but Stella had insisted she found them in January 1931 and reported her find to the police right away. Joseph was finally declared legally deceased in June of 1939. There are so many rumors, theories, speculation, and gossip as to what happened to Joseph. Many of these theories are unable to be verified, and the versions of events have even changed over time. Some say that Joseph fled voluntarily in order to avoid the fallout from a large corruption scandal that was about to be made public. Joseph has been reported alive from all around the world, from the West Indies, to hiding out in Canada, to playing bingo in North Africa, and even walking through Havana. There are different accounts of Joseph being murdered by mob gangsters, and the reasons behind the murders vary greatly. Others claim amnesia, and there are the rumors of suicide. In 2005, a 91-year-old woman named Stella Ferrucci Good passed away. Before I go any further, there are also different versions of this story. When Stella died, relatives found an envelope with the message, Do not open until my death, written on the front. Inside the envelope was a letter. Within the letter, Stella outlined Joseph's murder by three men. A Parks Department supervisor named Robert Good, who was also Stella's husband, a New York City police officer named Charles Byrne, and the officer's brother, who was a cab driver named Frank Byrne, who had worked for Jack Legg's Diamond. Some say that Joseph was targeted to reverse some court decisions which would help Jack's businesses. Others say that Joseph was killed due to unpaid debts to the mob bosses. Versions of the story state that somehow Joseph died during a struggle. In the letter, Stella had said that Joseph was buried in an area that would be where the New York City Aquarium sits today. There are accounts of a potter's field with hundreds to thousands of remains being located. If this is true, it would be impossible to locate Joseph's remains. For one, Joseph wore dentures, so no dental records would exist. The other reason is that Joseph has no direct descendants living to test DNA. It is likely that we will never know what happened to Judge Joseph Crater. Thank you so much for watching. Please remember to hit the like button and subscribe for future videos.